Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Casual Criminalist. Today, the trials and tribulations of Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, the forgotten silent movie star. I think I made a biographies video, which is another YouTube channel that I do about this guy, but it was ages ago. I don't remember everything. But I remember he got in, did he get in a lot of trouble and then he got like cancelled, <laughs> like for back in the day cancelling, even though he wasn't actually guilty of anything in the past, but his name was dragged through the mud so much. Look, it doesn't matter. Louis, come on, you're spoiling everything. We're going to get into it. Welcome to the show. What happens here on this show, one of my writers, in this case, Danny, thank you, Danny, has written me a script. I'm going to read it. We're going to learn all about it together. It's going to be fun. I've never read this before. That's the point of the show. Let's jump in. Who can remember the good old days before everything was utterly ruined by cancel culture? Ah, yes, the good old days where Harvey Weinstein was producing movies. You'd need to have a pretty long memory, cancel culture, maybe a modern turn, but celebrities were already getting cancelled over a hundred years ago. Danny and I, same page. Just ask Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. Well, you can't, obviously. He's been dead for ages. <laughs> but we can... St- <laughs> but we can- I don't know why that's so funny, but it is. it's like, he's dead. Of course he is. He's a log. Like, that is a name. Fatty Arbuckle is like, I know he's dead. It's like, although sometimes you're like, Henry Kissinger, yeah, he's dead. No, he's not. He's still alive. He's like a hundred. But we can still examine his tragic story, which may well be one of history's most brutally unjust examples of a beloved figure getting downgraded from celebrated hero to villain a zero overnight. You either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. The hugely influential comic star of the silent cinema screen was one of the most famous people on the planet for many years, but unlike his legendary contemporaries such as Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton, who gained cinematic immortality, it seems that Arbuckle's career was quietly brushed under the red velvet carpet. It's a bit tricky to revisit his classic pioneering works for yourself as the majority of his films no longer exist. Oh, it's so crazy that stuff can just, like nowadays, we don't have to, you know, there's no storing film. Wasn't there some like famous fire a few years ago, like in, in Hollywood or somewhere, which lost like a whole load of classic films, like at Sony or something? And it's just like, well, they're gone forever. We hadn't backed them up yet. We hadn't got them onto digital. And now it's like, even like stuff like this, it's never going anywhere. Like YouTube's probably got seven backups. I've got backups. It's like, unless, I mean, there could be like some Carrington event sort of destruction of technology because of a solar flare or whatever. But really, it's, it's data storage is cheap. This is going to be around forever. And it's like now movies, proper movies from back in the day are just lost. It's like, yeah, no, they're just done. They're just, maybe we'll find them someday. Someone's got a copy in their attic or something. But mostly they're just gone. It's a great loss for the country. He may have been one of the very first stars of Hollywood, but he also found himself embroiled in Tinseltown's very first scandal and later became the very first actor to get blacklisted in a saga which forever changed the motion picture industry in more ways than one. A technically illegal party thrown by the fabulously wealthy Arbuckle in 1921 led to the mysterious death of a young aspiring actress in his hotel room, after which Arbuckle was accused of rape and accidentally crushing her to death with his own vast weight. Ugly sh**, dude. That is grim. The aggressive persecution from a lawyer with an axe to grind led to a series of media circus trials in which dubious tactics were displayed on both sides, and the witnesses couldn't seem to make up their minds on exactly what they witnessed. Popcorn and custom pies at the ready as we try to piece together what exactly happens in room 1219 in San Francisco San Francisco Hotel on the 5th of September 1921, wow, exactly 100 years ago, and consider how the shifty behavior of certain individuals led to the dramatic fall of Hollywood's Prince of Silent Film. Fatty makes a dramatic entrance. If it's so, this guy's obviously overweight. <laughs> People were like, yeah, we'll just call him Fatty. Fatty Arbuckle. Roscoe Arbuckle didn't get off to the kindest starts in life. That's partly because, even before he was given the cruel name of Fatty, he had to put up with his very real full name, which was Roscoe Conkling Arbuckle. That's not too bad. Wait, is a Conkling something? Does that mean something? Does, does this mean something? Doesn't seem too bad. But he was only given the name because his dad hated him from birth. Roscoe weighed in a pretty heavy 13 pounds when he was born in Kansas in 1887. And wow, he's exactly 100 years older than me. I was born in 1887. I mean, 1987. He was born 100 years before me. How about that? Invaluable information. Thank you. And his opening scene in life proved to be a bit of a difficult experience for his mother Mary, who was a small and slender build. Come to think of it, his dad William was of a small and slender build too, as were all of Roscoe's eight siblings. What happened to Fatty? <laughs> Got a genetic shake of the dice. Either that, or maybe he's not his dad. 
This raised suspicions in William's mind that Roscoe wasn't his real father, and that Mary had been playing around with a much bigger guy on the side. The suspicions were almost certainly completely unfounded, as Mary was a devout, God-fearing Christian who had never dared dream of infidelity, bearing false witness, or coveting her neighbor's ass. But that didn't stop William from naming his new bouncing boy after Senator Roscoe Conkling of New York, a womanizing philanderer whom William utterly loathed. Nice. Yeah, that's f***ing classy, mate. Yeah, well done. That's cla- <laughs> most likely just a genetic roll of the dice but he happens to be big and you named him after someone you hate you, you seem like a bit of a dickhead to be honest mate in fact william was an utter knob mm-hmm, who would regularly get drunk and dish out random beatings to roscoe for the most trivial of reasons his simmering resentment for his son was further fueled by his wife's mary severe health problems which followed from the traumatic birth and of course this was apparently all roscoe's fault for being so big yes yes blame the baby that makes perfect sense after the family moved to santa Ana, california an eight-year-old roscoe had an unpleasant time at school where he was regularly teased and bullied about his weight. This was where he was first given the nickname of Fatty Arbuckle, a name that he always despised, even though it was destined to become the name by which he was best known. Oh, that's depressing, isn't it? Oh, God. They just... Imagine if, like, you're a famous movie star and they're calling you after you're, like, the, the cruelest name that you had at school. It wasn't all bad news for Arby. It'd be like, um, well, I wasn't bald at school, but they'd be like, yeah, Baldy Whistler. I wouldn't really mind, that's fine. <laughs> But it's like, that's what they're... Baldy, bald whistler. Slaphead whistler. It wasn't all bad news for young Arbuckle, though. It was around this age that he first took to the stage when a travelling theatre troupe pitched up in town and were in need of an emergency replacement for a child actor who had been taken ill. Roscoe was happy to fill in, although it wasn't maybe the most notable first chapter in a beckoning career in show business. Not only was he required to wear blackface, the barefoot role also required him to wear black feet. <laughs> Dude. Black feet, that's a whole other thing that I've never heard of and I didn't need to know about. God damn the past. And whilst home life was turbulent and occasionally violent, Roscoe enjoyed a healthy relationship with his loving mother. Things settled down a bit when his father, who frequently disappeared without explanation, finally left the family home for good, taking one of his older sons with him to start new jobs in a hotel miles away from Santa Ana. Wow, f***ing father of the year there, right? So not only doesn't he just leave, which is move number one but he takes one of his sons and he leaves the others behind to wonder why they weren't taken that's going to be great for his development this is one of those because this is casual criminalist this goes it goes like one of two ways one it completely ruins him and he just becomes like a drug addict wash up who does nothing or he's like you and he gets a chip on his shoulder and he becomes fatty arbuckle a silent movie star super rich and successful and then dragged through the mud but look you know it's that moment it's that pivot moment isn't it it can break you or it can make you it doesn't kill you makes you stronger i just was watching that arnold schwarzenegger documentary on netflix and his biography is one of my favorite books and it, he's talking about him and his brother and how his parents drove them super hard especially his dad and it basically made arnold and broke his brother just like two people same treatments different results and it's just like one gave arnold like that chip on his shoulder to be like i'm gonna do everything and the other one just to be like, it just crushed my self-confidence. Fascinating. But sadly, this more settled home life was more of a short than a feature-length film. In 1898, when Roscoe was just 11 years old, his mother died, quite possibly from the health issues which had arisen from Roscoe's own birth. There are conflicting reports as to what exactly happened next, although the gist of the events are broadly the same. Roscoe was sent away to live with his father and brother in the hotel. One account tells of Roscoe catching the train alone and then waiting for 12 hours at the platform for his father to pick him up, until he eventually realized that that wasn't going to happen. Another tells of Roscoe arriving at the hotel only to find his father and brother had quietly moved on the previous week without forwarding address in anticipation of Roscoe's imminent arrival. Oh my god, this poor f***ing kid. Jesus Christ. It's possible that both accounts are true. We do know for certain that Roscoe was sent away to the hotel to live with his father, who wasn't there. The hotel staff took pity on the bereaved, clearly distraught, and now homeless 11-year-old boy, offering him board in a tiny room. Some say it was actually a closet, although that sounds a bit Harry Potter to me, in return for doing odd jobs around the hotel. Depending on your perspective, this is either an act of overwhelming kindness from the hotel staff, or a tro troubling case of child labor, which would probably be found frowned upon today. Sure, it'd be frowned upon today, but I think this is kindness. Like, he's been abandoned by everything and i don't imagine that the welfare system is particularly well developed in 1898 or whatever so i and considering what like other sorts of labor and child labor was going on weren't kids like working in mines and back then and chimney sweeps and all of that nonsense this does sound like genuine kindness you gotta remember this was over 100 years ago 120 years ago but at least roscoe argbuckle was off the streets and life was about to take a turn for better fatty goes to hollywood 
So many entertainers seem to enjoy recounting far-fetched origin stories of how they were accidentally discovered singing in their shower or how their career took off following a surprise plot twist which wasn't even meant to happen. Fatty Arbuckle's rise to fame is no different. <laughs> I like these stories. But it's like, I don't know. Rise to fame sounds like a stupid thing to say. <laughs> it's not what I am. But it's like I just make videos that lots of people watch. But it's like, yeah, no, it wasn't like, oh, suddenly it's like, boom! It's just like, no, just you gotta, you make lots of stuff for a long time. <laughs> and then hopefully people watch it. And some stuff you make, they don't watch and some stuff they do and you're like okay good good yeah no there's no like exciting story it's just a grind oh, who are you are now he was apparently accidentally discovered when a talent scout stayed at the hotel who just so happened to overhear Roscoe singing to himself while he was polishing a doorknob or whatever. Roscoe was then encouraged to take part in a local rowdy talent show in which the acts were harshly judged by the tough crowd. The act was judged a success if the audience were cheering, but if they began to boo and jeer, the act was unceremoniously dragged off the stage with a shepherd's crook. <laughs> Just because you want to fulfill all of the, like, um... I cannot remember that word that is super obvious. Not memes, like, but... Stereotypes! Thank you, Simon, you big brain. Roscoe attempted a bit of singing and fooling around, but his performance didn't go down as well as it hoped, and he found himself the target of vicious heckling, prompting the slow entrance of the ominous shepherd's crook to yank the failure off the stage. In genuine fear of the approaching shepherd's crook, Roscoe panicked and executed a perfect somersault into the orchestra pit, much to the surprise and delight of the audience, who began roaring in approval ensuring that Roscoe won the competition. The story does have a whiff of fairy tale about it, but the idea of a vastly overweight boy performing a perfect somersault isn't as hard to swallow as you might think. A point that we'll come back to later is that Roscoe was surprisingly nimble on his feet and proved in adulthood that he was still more than capable of somersaulting on demand. Holy sh**. I can't somersault. I think that thing where people just stand and then they do a full somersault from just standing position to standing position. I'm like, one, how do you learn how to do that without crippling yourself? And two, how do you learn how to do that? I should learn how to do that. That'd be awesome. And then you'd just be like walking along people a bit like, you know, <laughs> I, I, I was hanging out with my mates the other day. We were at a swimming pool. They were like, it was like, I was like, it was just a swimming pool, you know, just like maybe 10 meters long, 15 meters long. And I have always known that I can swim quite, I've got like a surprisingly large lung capacity. And my mates are like, we're just, we're just swimming. And I'm like, I bet I can swim like four lengths underwater. And they're like, there is no fucking shot. And I'm like, all right, 50 bucks, equivalent of 50 bucks says that I can do four lengths underwater. And they're like, there is no way, but let me try. And they do like one and a quarter. The other guy does one and a half. And they're like, bro, what are you talking about? Four lengths. So I just go down swim four lengths, do another one, just for laugh, five lengths underwater, and then come up and they're like, what the f***? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's my, that's my trick. But a somersault on demand, that'd be also a good trick. Just, uh, just to casually learn it and they'd be like, 50 bucks doesn't just your somersault standing. What are you talking about? It's like, boom! <laughs> Because I'm not the most athletic looking guy. But by whatever means he was first discovered, Roscoe Armagapo was already touring in a traveling theater group. By the time he was on the verge of turning 18, he performed songs, told jokes, clowned around a bit, and demonstrated those impressive acrobatics whilst making a bit of a name for himself as the upcoming new star of vaudeville. In 1908, he met and fell in love with Minta Durfee, who was at the time a chorus girl, but who would later appear in silent films herself, going on to become the first leading lady for Charlie Chaplin. Wow! They married the very same year, although it was often remarked that they looked like an odd couple. By this time, the five foot nine inch Roscoe tipped the scale at well over 300 pounds. Hey Siri, what's 300 pounds in kilograms? It's 1.36 kilograms, so it's 136 kilograms. Good lord, that's a big boy. Whilst Minter was just over five feet with a petite figure, leading to speculation that sharing a bed might have been a little bit disastrous for little Minter. It wasn't the last time that people would speculate on how Roscoe's weight could lead to various serious issues in the bedroom for the other party. After embarking upon a long, upon a long tour of China and Japan with a vaudeville company in 1909, Roscoe Roscoe's gaze finally settled on the emerging movie industry upon his return to the US. His very first on-screen appearance was captured the same year in the 10-minute comic short Ben Skid, produced by the Selig Poliscope Company. 10 minutes might seem like a surprisingly short length for a film, but this was standard at the time as it was the maximum length that could be fitted onto a single film reel. There was a gradual move onto two reelers in later years in which viewers were treated to a whole epic 20 minutes of footage, even though the smaller cinema houses with only one projector had to take a brief clumsy intermission in between as they changed over the reels. I miss intermissions. I don't say, I say like I missed them as if I ever had them in the cinemas. But with, movies got really long. They can be like three hours. And it's like, yo, at some point, I'm going to need to have a slash in those three hours. And maybe I'd like to go and get another drink. Maybe I'd like another Diet Coke or another beer from the concession stand and spend some more money with you. Why not just have a 10-minute break? It's already bloody long. Let's just have a break. Just be like, 
do 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 let's all go to the lobby is that from simpsons i feel like that's from simpsons let's all go to the lobby and then you can get some snacks why not let's all go to the lobby let's all let's do that let's bring that back if i had a cinema that's what i would do the burgeoning industry generally felt at the time that the cinema audience were incapable of maintaining their attention on the screen for more than an absolute maximum of 20 minutes that may sound a bit silly nowadays to anyone who's managed to sit through a lord of the rings movie without needing to to dash outside for a gulp of air. By gulp of air, means a cigarette. <laughs> I need some fresh air. Fresh air! But maybe we'd come full circle now that YouTube has decided that typical viewer's attention span is no more than 60 seconds. A quick hello to these seven viewers who managed to make it this far. This has surprisingly high viewer retention. Like, the long stuff. I feel like YouTube either wants to, if They either want you to make really short stuff or really long stuff. There's like, there's two ways. And other than this show, and one other show, I generally make like stuff that fits in the middle, which isn't the best idea anymore. So, uh, hello everybody, glad you're here. This is a long episode, by the way, stay tuned. An interesting point to bear in mind here is that the very early stars of cinema weren't really stars at all. They usually weren't even given any kind of credit, so nobody even knew their real names. Instead, they were often given descriptive nicknames by the audience, such as the girl with dimples, the man with the stern face, and of course, in Arbuckle's case, Fatty. The reasoning behind these lack of credits was probably down to the studios feeling cautious about actors getting too big for their boots. If an actor became too well known, they could potentially start demanding more money for appearances. So it's better to just keep their identities a secret and have the audience regard them as familiar, yet largely nameless faces. That is a big brain business move. Uh, ethically worrying, but Jesus, that is clever. Because nowadays, it's the, you know, actors command huge salaries if they're, if they're a big name. Because they drive sales. It's crazy. I mean, it's not crazy. It's kind of how it should be. I like it. But... Wow. Clever. It was certainly a cost-effective strategy for the studios. The actors weren't really earning that much money in the early days, and there was little risk of them getting poached by another studio. But it only took a few years for the industry to change their stance on the issue. By around 1912, the actors were receiving their rightful credits, effectively giving rise to the very first Hollywood movie stars, with Fatty Arbuckle leading the charge of celebrity. After appearing in dozens and dozens of one-reelers for Keystone Studios, Arbuckle then gradually moved on to those epic two-reelers before forming his own production company, Comic, and showing the world that he could write and direct and star in his own movies. He's making some money at this point. A typical Fatty Arbuckle film was a fast-paced frolic involving slapstick comedy, chase scenes, and the obligatory pie-in-the-face gag. In fact, Arbuckle was one of the first directors to ever receive a pie-in-the-face on screen in the 1913 one-reeler A Noise from the Deep. These shorts were often given such intriguing names as Fatty's Wash Day, Fatty's Plucky Pup, Fatty's Magic Pants, and the slightly less snappy Mabel and Fatty Viewing the World's Fair at San Francisco. These in my modern brain of like YouTube titles, I'm like, these would not cut it. Maybe some caps. Maybe some, like, shocking news. Unbelievable. Like, that needs to be thrown in there. Mabel and Patty viewing the unbelievable World Fair at San Francisco. Mm -hmm. He wasn't really playing the same character as such in all these shorts. The name Fatty was just an indicator to the audience that it was another Fatty Arbuckle film. Although Arbuckle disliked the nickname and was actually still very self-conscious about his weight, he believed it was inevitable that the old taunt from his school days would stick with him throughout his movie career. Yeah, you just gotta lean into it, don't you? It's like, yo, being, I'm bald. Yeah, I'm bald. I'm bald. So what? Lean into it. Let's go. I slapped my own bald head. He did, however, refuse point blank to get cheap laughs from his girth. You never saw Fatty Arbuckle stuffing his face on screen or getting stuck in a door or sitting on a collapsing chair. Quite the opposite, in fact. You were more likely to see Arbuckle perform those incredible acrobatics or break out into a delicate dance routine. Not just on screen, either. He liked to keep up the demonstrations of elegant agility even when a camera wasn't pointing at him. Canadian actor Mark Sennett recalls that when he met Arbuckle for the first time, he was left gobsmacked when Arbuckle skipped up the stairs as lightly as Fred Astaire and then without warning went into a featherlight step, clapped his hands, and did a backward somersault as graceful as a girl tumbler. A 140 kilogram dude, 300 pounds, doing a backward somersault. Holy sh**. I'd, that's incredible. I'd kind of like to see this. It's clear that Arbuckle wanted to be recognized as a truly talented performer rather than just a man who was funny because he was overweight. He once said in 1917, quote, I refuse to make people laugh at my bulk. Personally, I cannot believe that a battleship is built funnier than a canoe, but some people do not feel that way about it. It does seem a bit odd then that the name Fatty appeared in the title of 27 of his shorts. Hey, he's just leaning into it. That's his brand. It's like he might not like it, but it's making him money. Still, if you ever dared to call him that to his face, it brusquely responds, I've got a name, you know. <laughs> oh, there it is in the park. 
and uh, my oldest kid's playing with like the other kids. And she's like, she's like, girl, girl. She's just talking to the girl like, girl, let's go here. And the girl's like, I have a name. <laughs> She was a bit older than her. It wasn't like my kid was being rude. She just couldn't remember her name or didn't know her name. And the kid's like, it wasn't like I've got a name. She said, you can call me Molly or whatever. Please call me Molly. <laughs> and like, it's just like, okay. like, she didn't see it as rude. She's just like, sure, Molly. <laughs> Girl, girl! Although Roscoe Arbuckle is often described as a contemporary of those cinematic legends, Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton, he was actually more of a mentor to them, particularly Buster, who got his first big break from Arbuckle and later revealed, I learned it all from him. Whilst at it, Arbuckle can also be credited with first discovering the comedian, actor, and entertainer Bob Hope, who got his first job with a touring troupe thanks to Arbuckle, and he would go on to enjoy a career spanning nearly eight decades. God damn, I'd like a career spanning eight decades. Can I have a career spanning eight decades? I'm doing this going this like 10 years ago. <laughs> Never mind. I'm not having a career spanning eight decades. What a shame. Oh, because he must have started when he was a kid or whatever. But it was perhaps Buster Keaton that shared the most chemistry with Arbuckle as they appeared in around 14 shorts together and became very close buddies. And in 1920, Arbuckle relinquished control of his comic production company to Buster. It might seem like an extraordinarily generous mood to just hand over your successful company to a mate, but Arbuckle didn't have the time to run his own business anymore. It just landed a juicy new contract with Paramount to appear in 18 new feature-length films over the next three years. Jesus Christ, they could churn them out back in the day. Whoa! On the assumption that audiences were now capable of maintaining their their attention over five whole reels 50 minutes jesus movies are like you have movies that are three hours now in fact it was an incredibly juicy contract arbuckle would be paid three million dollars in total making him the richest actor in hollywood and the first to secure a contract worth over a million dollars a year that's a lot in today's money. Just to put that in perspective, his three-year contract with Paramount would be worth around $45 million in today's money. One slight downside to the contract is that Arbuckle had to promise never to slip under the weight of 250 pounds. In fact, he'd be given a lucrative bonus by the studio every time he piled on another 50. But Arbuckle probably wasn't too bothered by that when he brought his first 21-room mansion. It didn't look as if shifting weight was ever likely to be on the cards anyway, with or without a $3 million contract. The biggest movie stars in the world definitely make more than $45 million a year, right? Like, sh even like podcasters who have their podcast, like Joe Rogan or whatever, he does more than 45 million a year, for sure. So, times have changed. Not everything in Arbuckle's life was entirely peachy, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> comes off as rather strange, like, only 45 million a year. <laughs> peasant. He and his wife, Minter, separated in 1921, although it wouldn't be until 1925 that Minter eventually filed for divorce on grounds of desertion. Arbuckle was also hitting the bottle quite heavily, and the combination of his drinking and his weight led to a serious bacterial infection in his leg. At one point, he was advised that he may possibly require amputation below the knee to save his life. He eventually managed to battle through the infection without amputation, but it's reported that he briefly became addicted to the morphine that he had been prescribed. But his career had never looked brighter. In late 1921, he'd got through an exhausting schedule in which he had completed three different films at once by frequently hopping from set to set. He was surely due a short celebratory break after this remark remarkable achievement before commencing work on the next movie in the pipeline. So, on the 5th of September, Roscoe Arbuckle decided to throw a party, and it was a party that would end with horrific consequences. Fatty's Big Party it was a party which he very nearly didn't attend at all. Along with his chums, actor Lyle Sherman and director Fred Fishback, Arbuckle had decided to drive down to San Francisco and rent out a whole suite of three connecting rooms at the top of the St. Francis Hotel, in which he planned the weekend-long party. Just before Arbuckle had set off in his custom-built Pierce Arrow touring car, he had received an alternative invitation from Buddy Buster Keaton to spend the weekend on Buster's new yacht. It was an invitation he should have accepted, but he instead decided to stick with his original plans. Another potential spanner had also been thrown in the works when Arbuckle had decided to get his car serviced before the trip. In a scene which could easily have been lifted from one of his own comic shorts, Arbuckle had accidentally sat down in the garage on a rag drenched in acid, which burned right through his pants and ended up causing secondary burns to both his buttocks as to both his buttocks as he leapt up and pranced around the garage. Oh my god, that sounds extremely uncomfortable. That must have been some mega powerful acid to burn right through his trousers. Holy sh Arbuckle later contacted his mates and told them that the trip might be off as he didn't think he'd be able to sit comfortably on the car seat after his arse had caught fire. Fred Fishback was having none of it, though. He generously sent Arbuckle a nice padded rubber ring on which to perch his scorched posterior. It was a nice gesture from a good friend, but it was another potential escape route from disaster, which had been unwittingly roadblocked.
I'm sure most of us have been to a few wild parties that got a little out of hand. Sure have. The one that springs instantly to mind is the time when things got so bad the party host had been aggressively evicted by his landlord at the end of the night. God damn. I'm not sure why most of us had clambered up onto the roof of his house in the middle of the night. And I'm not sure why we thought it would be a good idea to respond to the angry screaming from next door by getting out a couple of bongos and chanting to the lyrics to give peace a chance for about 90 minutes. Oh, <laughs> That's pretty bad. I know this sounds incredibly antisocial, it does, and I wouldn't say I'm proud of my involvement, you shouldn't be, but to bear in mind this was taking place on the noisiest street in the north of England, and the host of the party was probably one of the quieter residents. <laughs> There's this noisiest street in the north of England that exists. The party came to an abrupt halt when we heard the clattering of ladders against the side of the house, and the boiling red face of the landlord popped out of nowhere to inform us all that if we didn't get down immediately, he would beach seven shades of shit out of the lot of us. With hindsight, this would have probably been a brilliant moment for one of us to execute a perfect backward somersault over the landlords and land in the front garden to rapturous applause, but seeing as the landlord was much bigger than us, we kind of just meekly apologized and got down from the roof with our bongos to figure out what we were going to do about our now homeless friend. He wasn't that bothered, actually. It had been a top party, and the sticky chicken skewers were exquisite. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I don't mind the next morning. Oh, God, where am I going to live? Oh, fuck's sake. Need a new house. <laughs> I would have expected Fatty Arbuckle's party to have been a little more refined than that. The St. Francis Hotel was one of the swishest joints on the West Coast, with telephones in every room, which was practically unheard of at the time. Look, just because it's in a fancy place, it's just going to get out of hand in another way. <laughs> it's still, the people still party, I guess, like rock stars. They're famously partying for a reason. And it doesn't mean that they're getting on top of their house in the north of England. It just means that they're, they're doing naughty things in the penthouse of a hotel instead. From the three huge rooms rented out by the trio, room 1219 was to be a bedroom shared by Arbuckle and Fresh Fishback, while Lyle Sherman got his own private quarters in room 1221, and room 1220 was the designated party room. These guys are mad rich. <laughs> Why not have your own hotel room? A whole gang of show business types have been invited to the party to enjoy the free-flowing booze provided by Arbuckle and his mates. In fact, this was the biggest draw of the party. Ah, Prohibition 1920s! The year was 1921! And Prohibition had been in full swing for two years, but Arbuckle had managed to secure vast quantities of illegal hooch. This might have been considered a bit naughty, but there was a growing feeling at the time that these new celebrity movie stars from Hollywood could pretty much get away with whatever they wanted without consequence. It seemed unlikely that the police would dare to break up a party hosted by the now legendary Fatty Arbuckle. The stars of Tinseltown were above the law within reason. <laughs> Which is bad, but also sounds like fun! This is where the fun begins. And so, we pull that bootleg liquor up for grabs in room 1220 of the St. Francis Hotel. It's a wonder that the party attracted a whole raft of guests eager to join in the celebration, and one of those guests was Virginia Rapp. Not that much is known for sure about the life of Virginia Rapp. I mean, plenty was said about her in the immediate aftermath, and much of that was just salacious fabrications cooked up to denigrate her character. As we'll discover later, this got very unpleasant indeed. It's often reported that Virginia was a failed actress who had fallen on hard times, whose life was beginning to spiral out of control, but this didn't seem to be the case at all. Hailing from Chicago, Virginia had forged a pretty successful career as both a model and a fashion designer, during which time she became engaged to dress designer Robert Moskowitz, who then tragically was killed in a car accident. She later embarked upon a long-term relationship with the leading silent film director and producer Henry Lerman, and it was announced around this time that she had tried to break into the movie industry herself. She hadn't yet become a fully-fledged star, largely appearing in uncredited bit parts in shorts, although she did have a single prominent role in the 1917 comedy romance Paradise Garden. But that's not to say that she'd given up on her ambition. Virginia was still a 30-year-old aspiring actress when she turned up to the party hosted by Arbuckle, a man whom it's believed she didn't know that well. It's not known for sure if Virginia was even officially invited or whether she was just kind of gate-crashing the events. But we do know for sure that Virginia would never get the chance to appear in another movie. At some point during the party, Virginia had visited the bedroom in 1219, the bedroom shared by Arbuckle and Fishback, and is said to have had some sort of encounter with Roscoe Arbuckle. Following this encounter, Virginia could be heard screaming in pain and was found writhing in agony on the bed. It was initially suspected that she might have just drunk too much dodgy hooch. The first doctor on the scene concluded that her condition was most likely caused by intoxication and there was no need for Virginia to be rushed to the hospital. Instead, she was moved to hotel room 1227 at the hotel for a couple of days, paid for by Arbuckle. But Virginia's condition was to deteriorate dramatically. Still suffering from chronic pain in her abdomen, Virginia was eventually taken to Wakefield Sanatorium, where she sadly died just two days later from peritonitis, an infection of the inner lining of the belly brought on, in this case, by a ruptured bladder. 
But the question remained over how exactly Virginia Rapp had endured a seemingly spontaneous bladder rupture over the course of a party. Your bladder can rupture in a car accident, right? If you really need to pee, and then you're in a car accident, it can burst. So my thinking would be, like, she needs to pee, and she's, you know, doing having some sort of encounter with Mr. Arbuckle, and he's a large man and maybe he squeezes her. It's possible, yet incredibly rare, for a bladder rupture to be sparked by binge drinking, and of course, this is the conclusion at which many people arrive. Virginia had gone way overboard with the illicit booze and had effectively drunken herself to death. But it's more common for a spontaneous bladder rupture to be brought on by intense physical trauma, and this led to speculation of a more sinister kind. Just what exactly had taken place between Roscoe Arbuckle and Virginia Rapp in that hotel room? Can you hold your pee to the point of bursting? Because I'm assuming the reason that you can have a burst bladder if you drink too much is because you're drinking so much and you're too drunk so you don't realize the pain so you really need to be and you're just holding it and you're just holding it and you're like the pain isn't quite registering as it normally would or whatever that it's not really pain it's just like that discomfort it's a kind of undescribable feeling but everybody in the world knows it what it's like to really need to have a pee and can you ho- surely it would just you'd just be like oh i've wet myself <laughs> before especially if you're super drunk uh, before it would be uh, like, uh, like before it would burst. Somehow I've never, I've been drunk, drunk many times, never managed to wet myself when I'm drunk, as far as I know. <laughs> Maybe I've been so drunk that it's like, yeah, I peed myself and then I was just so dry to even wake up and it dried. <laughs> you would have noticed. Oh, I've thrown up once. I was just asleep and it was like, oh, I was like, oh gosh. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. <laughs> that kebab is now in my bed. Oh God. And it was, I was at university. It was like a tiny little bed and I'm like, so I can't even go to the other side of the bed and sleep. It's just, oh God, I guess I'll sleep on the floor. I better get a bucket. Oh, oh, bad times. Thanks for that story, Simon. We'll appreciate that. Just what exactly had taken place between Roscoe Arbuckle and Virginia Rapp in that hotel room? An alternative theory began to take shape. Arbuckle had lured Virginia Rapp into his hotel room and made unwanted sexual advances on the actress. After forcing himself upon her, the sheer bulk of Arbuckle, who weighed 226 pounds at the time, had crushed Virginia and damaged her internal organs, causing her bladder to rupture, which led to the fatal infection. Why do we have to assume these are unwanted? I mean, maybe they could just be getting down to business, and he's a very large man. So... possible? A slightly mysterious woman by the name of Maud Delmont seemed convinced that this was more than just a theory. She was apparently a good friend of Virginia's, who had been there at the party. And after Maud first rushed into room 1219 upon hearing her friend's screams, she came across both Arbuckle and Virginia, the latter of whom was laying on the bed and screaming that she was dying. Virginia was only capable of uttering three other coherent words. Arbuckle did it. Um, well, yeah. Wait, I don't understand, like, this is gonna be if not reasonable doubt, I'd say, is there any evidence that they, he was forcing himself on her? I don't want to be like, she's not accusing him of that. She could literally be just saying, well, we were getting it on and he was on top of me and he did it. He burst my bladder or whatever. He's, he's done something to my insides. It doesn't mean like, right? Right? Fatty spot of bother. Maud Delman wasted no time in recounting her version of the story to the press, the police, and pretty much anyone else who was willing to listen. For reasons that aren't entirely clear, it was well established that Arbuckle had spent a big chunk of the party wandering around in his pajamas, bathrobe, and slippers. You'd think that the host of such a lavish party would have the decency to get dressed, but it seemed that nobody really batted an eyelid. Yeah, because he can do what he wants. He's fatty Arbuckle. He's got a party in the penthouse at some fancy hotel. If he wants to wear a dressing gown, he can wear a dressing gown. Fatty Arbuckle was a major motion picture star, and he was allowed to be a bit quirky exactly <laughs> it's like if uh what's that how's that quote go if you're rich you're not crazy you're eccentric seems like fatty is a little bit eccentric maybe he plans to put on some proper clothes when the party really got going later in the evening according to maud her friend virginia had been enjoying a few drinks with arbuckle in the main party room but she had no more than three in total and certainly wasn't drunk arbuckle had apparently seemed enthusiastic about the prospect of helping to further virginia's movie career before he pulled her into room 1219 with the words i've waited for you for five years and now I've got you. Maud was concerned by this turn of events and became even more concerned when she first heard Virginia's screams. She claims to have dashed over to the door of room 1219, only to find that it was locked. After furiously battering and kicking at the locked door, she was eventually let into the room by Arbuckle, who seemed in strangely high spirits considering all the drama. Maud recalled that he was initially wearing a comical grin alongside his pajamas and bathrobe, but it seems that he eventually became annoyed by all of the noise that Virginia was making as he turned to Maud and barked, shut her up, or I'll throw her out a window. Oh my god. But this is Maud's testimony, right? So, okay, let's believe Maud for a second, because this obviously adds, like, a bit of new spice to this, because... Holy sh**. 
He soon cheered up again as he skipped out of the room and went back to mingle and dance with the more considerate guests who weren't screaming the whole place down. Moore's accusation was backed up by two other female witnesses from the party, Zay Previn and chorus girl Alice Blake, who both later made statements to the police confirming that at some point in the party, they had heard Roscoe, heard Virginia utter the words, Roscoe hurt me. Roscoe Albert, which he did. But that doesn't mean he assaulted you. So they're backing up that part of the statement, not the part about him saying he'd throw out a window or shut her up and stuff, right? Roscoe Arbuckle was said to be taken quite aback when the police first arrived on his doorstep in Los Angeles on the 9th of September and announced that he was under arrest on the suspicion of R-word and first-degree murder. It's reported that he initially thought it was a wind-up until he responded with a hearty laugh, asking, And who do you suppose I killed? But he soon quietened down when the police responded with the name of Virginia Rapp. It's worth noting at this point that Armuckle may not have even been aware that Virginia had been taken seriously ill and rushed to the hospital. The last he may have known of the matter, she was still recuperating from a particularly bad hangover in a room at the St. Francis Hotel for which she was footing the bill. This seems like he doesn't know, genuinely doesn't know what's going on. It's worth remembering, Arbuckle's initial defense would differ significantly from the defense he would later give in court. He claimed that Virginia had been enjoying a few drinks when she suddenly started complaining that she couldn't breathe and then became hysterical, stripping off her clothes in front of everyone. Two of the other female guests had taken Virginia to the privacy of room 1219, where they tried to calm her down by fully disrobing her and placing her in a bathtub of cold water whilst Arbuckle telephoned for a doctor. This isn't what happened. Why, like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, this is really suspicious because he's making up, like, my my version of his story, where it's like they were getting it on and he crushed her a little bit, is way more believable than just making something up which doesn't seem to match the facts at all. In this version of the story, there was no point at which Arbuckle and Virginia Rapp were ever alone together. San Francisco District Attorney Matthew Brady wasn't convinced by that. Following the statements given by Maud Delmont and the two other witnesses, he seemed determined to bring Roscoe Arbuckle to trial. And honestly, fair enough, because he got two witnesses that directly contradict his statement. Fatty, where's your lawyer at? Is your Did your lawyer come up with this strategy? Because they seem a bit of a shit lawyer. I just came up with a better defense strategy. Come on, you can afford a very good lawyer. Brady kicked off by issuing his own statement to the press. To quote it, the evidence in my possession shows conclusively that either a R word or an attempt to R word was perpetrated on Miss Rapp by Roscoe Arbuckle. The evidence discloses beyond question that her bladder was ruptured by the weight of the body of Arbuckle, either in an R word assault or an attempt to commit R word. And I'm doing all of this if you're new to the show because otherwise I don't get any money for these videos because of YouTube censorship policies, which is a bit rubbish. I know it interrupts the flow, and now I'm interrupting the flow even more. I just have to explain myself. He then got to work forming a case as Roscoe Arbuckle was held without bail at the San Francisco Hall of Justice. Without bail? Isn't this what bail is for in America? Like, he's not going anywhere. He's a big like celebrity, it's going to be very hard for him to flee. And Brady wasn't mucking about. He wanted to see Arbuckle convicted of first degree murder, punishable by the death penalty. Holy sh! Matthew Brady was keen to push on with the prosecution so quickly that much of the crucial evidence, such as an autopsy result, wasn't even available yet. He seemed to think that the testimony provided by his star witness Maud Delmont and the two other party guests would be more than enough to send Roscoe Arbuckle to the gallows or the electric chair, but then he quickly came across a minor snag with his star witness Maud. It turns out she was about as reliable as a bank statement belonging to a Nigerian prince. Brady's suspicions had been first aroused when he noticed that Maud couldn't appear to stick to the same version of events. In one version of her story, she barely drank anything at all before the incident, while in another version, she'd already down between 8 to 10 whiskeys. Holy sh**, that's a difference. It's like, one, well, no, as, as sober as a judge. The other one, I was f***ed up, bro. Like, I was wasted, son. In one version, she'd been a lifelong friend of Virginia Rapp, while in another version, they'd only met a few days prior to the party. These are huge differences. It felt as if Maud was just making stuff up on the spot without bothering to try and remember what she'd said in a previous statement. That was only the tip of the iceberg, and that is those are that is major differences. After digging a little deeper, Brady discovered that Maud had a pretty extensive criminal record for bigamy, fraud, and oh dear me, extortion. Oh, what she does? Wow, how could this ever be used as extortion? And if that wasn't bad enough, it was later to go with the Maud had sent a telegram to her friend Virginia while she was still screaming in pain at the hospital. The 15 words say it all. We have Roscoe Arbuckle in a hole here. Chance to make money out of him. Oh my god. Maud, you're just that should all be thrown out immediately, Maud, because fuck 
you, and I hope you get some punishment for whatever perjury you're committing here. Brady knew that there was no way that he could use Maud Delmont as a witness. Okay, she didn't perjure herself because they didn't get that far, but still, not cool. And bearing in mind that Maud's original allegations were the catalyst of all of this, he must have known that his case had now almost entirely fallen apart. But he wasn't going to let such a trivial matter get in the way of prosecution. Wow, he's got railroaded, hasn't he? He still seemed fiercely persistent in his pursuit of Roscoe Arbuckle. There is no escape from this. Why? Dude, your case fell apart and he, he still wants to get the guy because he's like, I want to get the guy because of this. That thing falls apart and he's still locked into getting the guy, which is just bad prosecutor. This is just bad work. We can only speculate why he was so keen to see Arbuckle's head on a spike. Brady had been described by acquaintances as a self-serving, ruthless man with blind ambition and a quick temper. Yeah, it's just going to look good for him to trial him and if he wins, it's going to be good for his career. Wow. Wow. You. It's been suggested that he had his eyes on the job of California governor and securing a successful prosecution against Hollywood's biggest star might ramp up his profile and credibility. But the decision on whether or not Arbuckle would ultimately face trial rested in the hands of police judge Sylvain Lazarus. Great name, Sylvain Lazarus. That's a cracker. And he eventually concluded that Arbuckle should indeed be put on trial, but on the reduced charge of manslaughter rather than first degree murder. His reasoning, though, was very odd. Lazarus stated in his ruling to quote, and this is a long quote, here we go. I do not find any evidence that Mr. Arbuckle either committed or attempted to commit. The court has been presented with the merest outline. The district attorney has barely presented enough facts to justify my holding the defendant on the charge which is here filed against him. But we are not trying Roscoe Arbuckle alone. We are not trying the screen celebrity who has given joy and pleasure to the entire world. We are actually, gentlemen, trying ourselves. <laughs> what are you talking about? We are trying our present-day morals, our present-day social conditions, our present-day looseness on thought and lack of social balance. The issue here is really and truly larger than the guilt or innocence of this poor unfortunate man. The issue is universal and grows out of the conditions which are a matter of comment and notoriety and apprehension to every true lover and protector of our American institutions. I have decided to make a holding on the ground of manslaughter. What are you doing? You just doing something that's like, let's have a look and see where this goes, even though I don't think he's guilty. Judge. What? Judge is a bit shit. Prosecutor's a bit shit. What's going on? That is one big pile of shit. And that's where the quote ends. The first important point to note here, contrary to how this saga is often reported, Roscoe Arbuckle was never once charged with our word. The second important point to note here is that everyone just seems to have gone a bit batshit crazy in their decision making. Matthew Brady was pursuing a prosecution triggered by a known extortionist who couldn't get her story straight and who had already signaled her intention to get money out of Arbuckle. Aside from the two other party guests who later claimed to have heard Virginia confirming that Roscoe had hurt her, there was no other evidence to go on. Judge Lazarus seemed to agree that the case for the prosecution was woeful and that Arbuckle barely even deserved to be detained. But he's like, yeah, let's go anyway. What the f judge? And yet it comes to the quite bizarre conclusion that Arbuckle should stand in the dock whilst the court ponders over modern day morals and lack of social balance. But as he sat in his cell and pondered over his fate, he may have taken some comfort from the charge against him getting downgraded to something that didn't potentially conclude in execution by the state. He may also have pondered over how that yachting weekend with Buster Keaton might have panned out. He should have done that. He should have done that instead. Of course, this made all the headlines, and that's putting it mildly. It's often been said that O.J. Simpson's trial was the trial of the century, helped along in no small measure by the blanket live television coverage. But the trial of Fatty Arbuckle would have given OJ's trial a run for its money, and Arbuckle was arguably an even bigger star in the prime of his career. The newspapers couldn't get enough of it over the following months as doctored photographs of Arbuckle behind bars ran along headlines such as Arbuckle faces gallows, Fatty arraigned as slayer. Christ, the press is such a piece of shit. Some quarters of the press took a reasonably fair and balanced perspective of the unfolding events, but it seems that any of the massively popular newspapers owned by media baron William Randolph Hearst took a more sensationalist and judgmental stance. Well, given that William Randolph Hearst is basically famous for inventing yellow journalism, it's not really surprising. And and yeah, those newspapers are pieces of shit. As Arbuckle was depicted as a clearly guilty drug addict, drunken philanderer who preyed on young defenseless women. Oh my god, he should be suing these people so hard. One editorial cartoon in her San Francisco Examiner was given the caption, They walked into his parlor and portrayed Arbuckle at the center of a spider's web, drinking from two liquor bottles and contemplating the seven women who have been caught in his web. Oh my god. Sue so the sh out of them, Arbuckle. You might think that William Randolph Hearst was another individual who just added in for Arbuckle, but it sounds as if he was more about shifting newspapers. Famously so, he just wanted to make money, and he did. Every time another sensationalist Arbuckle story appeared on the front page, sales would go through the roof. As Hearst himself observed, I sold more newspapers during the Arbuckle trials than when the Lusitania went down. But his papers 
went way, way too far. I'm not going to dwell on all of this in too much detail, but it's often wrongly reported that Arbuckle had to defend himself in court over the allegation that just prior to accidentally crushing Virginia Rapp to death, he had sexually assaulted her with a piece of ice, though this piece of ice later evolved into a Coke bottle and a champagne bottle. Not true at all. The story originated in one of Hearst's newspapers and was possibly a twisted version of a genuine moment when some of the party guests rubbed ice on Virginia's stomach to help calm and cool her down. But although this allegation pops up all the time in association with the trials of Roscoe Arbuckle, it never existed outside of the sickest fabrications thrown up from William Randolph Hearst's attempt to sell even more papers. Yeah, bad dude. Roscoe Arbuckle did get a bit of support from family and friends, most notably from his then estranged wife, Minta DeFree, who traveled from her mother's home in California to attend the first trial and pose for pictures, standing loyally by his side. If your ex-wife is coming and doing that for you, that should say something about the, the, the character of the dude. I think this is such a fucking cunt. Like, it's just someone was trying to extort him and it got way out of control by a prosecutor who wants to railroad someone and a judge who is, like, keen on examining society's flaws for whatever fuck reason and that piece of William Randolph Hearst, who's printing all this garbage in the newspapers. Studio executives apparently warned actors not to speak publicly in defense of Arbuckle, as the movie industry was keen to avoid any further association with this very first Hollywood scandal. All of Arbuckle's films had already been effectively banned from cinemas, although there was a general expectation that the ban would be lifted should Arbuckle be found innocent. It seems that most actors complied with the request from studios to keep Stun, probably in fear of getting reprimanded or destroying their own careers. And it maybe wasn't too hard for them to keep quiet during the era of silent movies as they already had a fair bit of practice in that kind of thing. But a boom, boom, But Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin were both brave enough to defy the instruction and speak to the press in support of Arbuckle. Also, but such big stars that they can't possibly, you know, it's like they can't, you know, what are you going to do? Not put Charlie Chaplin in a film because he spoke up? Like, yeah, you could put like a lower actor. You'd be like, he's not going to find work again. But he's Charlie Chaplin. He's going to find work. Not only were they good friends with the actor, but they would also have been aware that they were both such big crowd pullers that no studio in their right minds would have dared to fire them exactly. So Chaplin seemed more than happy to tell the press, I know Roscoe to be a genial, easygoing type, not harm a fly. A big chunk of the general public seemed to agree with this sentiment, perhaps finding it impossible to comprehend that the lovable, comical, roll roly poly star of the silver screen could ever have been responsible for the death of an innocent woman. But not everyone was convinced of Arbuckle's innocence, and not everyone was patient enough to wait for a verdict. Before, like, Randolph Hearst as well. Before the main trial had even got underway, hundreds of women gathered around the San Francisco courthouse to protest against the acceptance of sexual misconduct in society and to call for Roscoe Arbuckle to be held accountable for his wicked crimes. And it was against this backdrop of vocal condemnation that Roscoe Arbuckle arrived at the city courthouse on the 14th of November 1921 to defend his name. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Patty's day out in court. It was always going to be a bit tricky dealing with a case in which most of the witnesses were completely plastered on illegal hooch, and the constant changing of stories and statements from everyone involved, notably Roscoe Arbuckle himself, made for a deeply confusing and chaotic trial. If it had ever been adapted into a blockbuster movie, they may as well have gone the whole hog and thrown in a few pie-in-the-face scenes for light relief. Still, maybe the medical experts and criminologists weren't always completely wasted during their involvement in the saga, and they might have been able to stick to the same story, but every time Matthew Brady appeared to land a sucker punch with one of his witnesses for the prosecution, the efforts were diluted somewhat when the same witness faced cross-examination from Arbuckle's defense counsel, Gavin McNabb. Grace Holtzson was a local nurse who had attended to Virginia after she'd been rushed to hospital. Grace appeared to glare angrily at Arbuckle throughout the testimony, as though she was utterly convinced of his guilt. She told Brady that she believed Arbuckle had raped Virginia, as there were bruises on her body, and that her internal organs had been torn in a way that suggested brute force. But under cross-examination, Grace admitted that it was possible that the bruises could have been caused by the heavy jewelry that Virginia was wearing and that the bladder rupture could have been the result of an existing medical condition. Venturing further back into the timeline of this tragedy, Brady posed questions to Dr. Arthur Beardsley, who had been the hotel doctor first on the scene in room 2109. Dr. Beardsley, who seemed to be of the opinion that Virginia's ruptured bladder may have been caused by external force, despite the fact that he initially seemed to conclude that Virginia was just suffering from the effects of heavy intoxication. The doctor later admitted to government NAB that during the whole period he spent with his patient, Virginia never once said anything that implicated Roscoe Arbuckle. This just seems like the person who kicked this all off was trying to extort him. Like, 
This is ridiculous. The local criminologist, Dr. Edwin Heinrich, sent a shockwave through the court when he took the stand with what he believed to be compelling evidence, something which Brady's prosecution case had been so far very much lacking. Okay, let's go. Let's see what this is. Dr. Heinrich claimed that he had come into possession of Virginia's fingerprints on the door handle of the hotel room, which were superimposed by Arbuckle's fingerprints, indicating that Virginia had tried to get out of the room, but Arbuckle had placed his hand over hers and slammed the door shut in a bid to prevent her escape. Okay. I mean, if that's the case, and that is legitimate science, that's fairly compelling stuff. However, oh, okay, here we go. A former federal investigator, Ignatius McCarthy, later took the stand to propose that he believed the fingerprints were faked, whilst the hotel maid insisted that the whole room had been comprehensively cleaned several times from top to bottom before any investigation took place. Okay, well... They need to have, current, you've got to have a chain of evidence, right? It can't just be this guy is just making this up. There needs to be evidence of those fingerprints being collected by the police and then being handed off to him for analysis. And then them being the same thing. It's called the chain of custody, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yes, all right. Well, the experts aren't doing a very good job of convincing anyone of Arbuckle's guilt, so let's see how we fare with those inebriated party guests. What about those other two guests who claim to have heard Virginia confirm that Arbuckle was responsible? Well, chorus girl Alice Blake proved to be a bit of a non-starter. Although she initially told police that she had heard Virginia speak, she now appeared to have had a change in her recollection and refused to confirm this in court. Yes, the sort of thing you'd be like, yeah, I think so, but then it's like, under oath? Much bigger deal. Meanwhile, the other guest, Zay Prevon, went several stages further in demolishing the prosecution and making a mockery of her original police statement. She now said, I didn't see very much, and I was repeating what Maud Delmont told me. Virginia Rapp went into the bedroom with Roscoe Arbuckle because she wanted to. That's all I have to say. Well, that kind of destroys it, right? She was like the other person. There were two, two witnesses, or three witnesses. Two of them have said, like, no, that's not what it was. And the third one was trying to extort him. So no, no, no. Well, it wasn't quite all she had to say. For an encore, she went on to say that she'd always considered Arbuckle to be a kind and thoughtful man. <laughs> The prosecution rests. Jesus Christ. That's your witness you called prosecution? What are you up to? Still, Brady Matthew had another party guest witness to pull out of the hat. This time it was model Betty Campbell, who revealed in her testimony that Arbuckle was smiling a few hours after the incident. And that's it. I think Brady was trying to convey the message that Arbuckle hadn't shown the slightest bit of remorse or concern after a guest had been taken ill at his party. Well, that's because he probably thinks that she's just had too much to drink. So he's like, hey, good party! But Brady may have been better off asking Betty Campbell to stay home. Later on to cross-examination, Betty admitted that the prosecution had threatened to get her sent to prison if she didn't cooperate and testify against Arbuckle. Holy sh**, dude. That is some serious stuff. So far, thrown in prison for what? <laughs> so far, Roscoe Arbuckle probably wasn't sweating too much over the verdict, as the prosecution seemed to be tripping itself up at every turn and performing a series of comedy pratfalls for the courtroom audience. Yeah, just wait till they get called for the defense. Jesus. When he took the stand himself a testimony that spanned over four hours, he appeared remarkably calm and measured, as if perhaps a little tired after having swapped his lavish millionaire lifestyle for a couple of months of behind bars. But the curious thing about Arbuckle's defense is that his story had changed significantly since it originally told the police and press that he had never once been alone with Virginia Rapp, who had suddenly become hysterical and started stripping off her clothes in the main party room. This is the most suspicious thing, that he changed his story. So we have to ask, why? Why did this change? Let's find out. This is the most suspicious thing that I think we've seen so far. He now claimed that he had wandered into his bedroom in room 1219 in order to finally change out of those pajamas, bathrobe, and slippers. He was surprised to discover Virginia vomiting in the toilet of his bathroom. Initially assuming, like many others, that she'd just had too much to drink, he became more concerned when Virginia began trying to tear off her clothes while screaming in pain. Arbuckle helped her out of her dress and laid her down on the bed, spending no more than 10 minutes alone with her before he called in other guests to help. One of the other guests was Maud Delmont, who applied ice to Virginia's stomach to try and cool her down, but it sounds as if Maud then needed calming down herself as she suddenly became very confrontational with Arbuckle, who eventually lost his patience and threatened to throw Maud, not Virginia, out of the window if she didn't shut up. I think we're meant to assume that Arbuckle was just annoyed in the heat of the moment and had no intention of carrying out his threat, but it's still a bit weird to admit that you were threatening to throw a woman out of a top-story hotel window whilst trying to defend yourself on a manslaughter charge. I think it speaks to the fact that he didn't mean it. He wouldn't bring it up because it's just his word against hers. He wouldn't bring it up. He'd say, like, I never said that if he wasn't being honest. But it just seems to be like, oh, yeah, I said that. I didn't mean it. Obviously, I wasn't going to throw out of the window. That's absurd. In fact, the whole defense from Arbuckle is a little puzzling. And you have to wonder why this version clashes so much with the original 
original statements to the police and the press. It could be construed that he was guilty and was now panicking after realizing his original story wasn't strong enough as nobody else at the party witnessed Virginia tearing off her clothes in the party room. Or it could have been that he was reluctant to admit in his original statement that he'd ever been alone in a hotel bedroom with a partially undressed woman who died four days later, but now he had been forced to reveal more of the truth to prove his innocence. It's really suspicious. This is super suspicious, but I do lean towards that because the prosecution's just so weak and this is all built, built upon someone who wrote down that she wanted to extort him, basically. Whatever the case, it seems that the other defense witness called up by Gavin McNad did a much better job of defending Arbuckle than Arbuckle himself. Medical evidence was presented to the court, which showed that there was no case of a spontaneous ruptured bladder. Whoa. Doc, whoa. Okay. Doctors testified that Virginia had a pre existing chronic bladder condition, whilst a nurse reveal, revealed that Virginia had complained of severe abdominal pain six weeks prior to the party. The coroner concluded that Virginia Rapp had been suffering from chronic inflammation of the bladder and acute peritonitis, and whilst there were a few bruises on her body, there was no evidence whatsoever of an attempted sexual assault. Well, this kind of blows it apart, then, doesn't it? Because there's going to be evidence of that. Because if someone's accusing someone of, like, our words, they're going to check if that happened. I don't know if they could do that in the 1920s or whatever but i'm assuming like no evidence of it of attempted sexual assault i mean there's just nothing to this one final interesting point about the defense is that gavin McNabb had originally intended to present several other unsavory implications regarding virginia's personal life and medical history but arbuckle himself had reportedly requested him to drop this angle out of respect for virginia rap the defense was probably still pretty confident of a not guilty verdict though however it was not to be after 44 hours of deliberation the jury conceded defeat and returned to the courtroom to declare a hung jury. They were deadlocked, 10 to 2, majority in favor of acquittal, and a mistrial was ruled. Wait, 10 to 2 in favor of acquittal? How's that? Isn't that enough? I thought they just need one juror to be like, wait, they need three? Is that right? Three out of 12? Some of the jury members who had voted against conviction later admitted that they felt that Arbuckle was probably guilty, but not beyond reasonable doubt. There's something a bit dodgy about the selected jury, though. One of the two jury members who voted for conviction went by the name of Helen Hubbard, and she had been particularly vocal in her condemnation of Roscoe Arbuckle right from the very beginning. Well, it's forming an opinion ahead of it, isn't it? She had reportedly told other jurors that she would continue voting guilty until hell freezes over and had refused to even examine exhibits or read transcripts during the deliberations. How are you not kicked out for this? It turns out that her husband was a lawyer with close connections to prosecutor Matthew Brady. How are you on that jury? That is a conflict of interest. But she never tried to hide this and indeed felt quite surprised herself that she had made it through the selection process. <laughs> she also strongly maintained that a marriage had nothing to do with her judgment. She was convinced that Arbuckle was guilty. Well, why don't you look at some of the evidence, then, if you're so convinced? But if you were to listen to Gavin McNabb's and Roscoe Arbuckle's public response to the hung jury, you'd be forgiven for thinking that they hadn't been in the same courtroom when the verdict was declared. There were two jury members who had voted for conviction. The other was called Thomas Kilkenny, but unlike Helen Hubbard, he refused to speak to the press afterward, and so it seemed that he was very conveniently forgotten, whilst all the blame of the verdict was pinned on the apparently hostile and prejudiced Helen Hibbert. Gavin McNabb Nab even began making blatantly false public statements in which he referred to an entirely fictitious 11 to 1 verdict. Meanwhile, here's Arbuckle's take on the hung jury, if we're to assume that he had any hand in putting together the public statements. But for one woman on the jury of 12 representatives, men and women, a woman who refused to allow her fellow jurors to discuss the evidence or reason with her, and who would not give any explanation for her attitude, my trial would have resulted in an immediate acquittal. It's worth remembering that at this point, women only had very recently been legally allowed to serve on some US juries. And were still considered ineligible in most states. The defense team's angle seemed to be along the lines of, see what happens when you put a woman on the jury. Whatever next, a woman judge its political correctness gone mad. Maybe the next jury would be kinder to Arbuckle's cause, or maybe not. Arbuckle's defense team certainly seemed a lot more relaxed during the second trial, which got underway on January 11th, 1922. Well, that was one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is they were so confident of a favorable outcome that they could barely be bothered to put up a defense. Whoa, do your job, lawyers. I'm sure he's paying you a lot of money. Make the effort, huh? In fact, Gavin McNabb decided that Arbuckle didn't even need to testify for this one, and McNabb himself didn't even bother to deliver a closing statement. It was as if he was just either hoping to squeeze in a few extra rounds of golf over the next few weeks, or he just assumed it was in the bag. If the case for prosecution was a little shaky during the first trial, it was positively convulsing in death spasms by the time it got to the second. One witness for the prosecution we didn't mention during the first trial was the studio security guard, Jesse Norgard, who had originally testified that 
Arbuckle once approached him with a cash bribe in return for the keys to Virginia Rapp's dressing room. Oh my. Jesse said that Arbuckle had insisted that he just wanted to play a little prank on the actress, but Jesse didn't trust him and refused to hand over the keys. This didn't really lead anywhere during the first trial. Arbuckle openly laughed off the suggestion as ridiculous and claimed that he would never have done such a thing. But during the second trial, more evidence came to light. Uh oh. Jesse Norgard already had a criminal record, and he was currently facing charges over the sexual assault of an eight year old girl. Oh my god. Well, for one, what the f and the second thing, I thought it was going to be like more evidence occurred, like there was video of him asking this dude for the keys, which obviously wouldn't be because it's 1920s, but you know what I mean. I thought it was going to go on his side, but it's not. It's going on the other side. Jesse had been offered a potential sentence reduction from Matthew Brady if he agreed to provide some sort of testimony against Arbuckle. Write it off immediately. That is incredibly corrupt. So it sounds as if he just made something juicy up to try and shave a few years off his prison time. Dr. Heinrich was back in court for the retrial. He was the criminologist who claims that he came across incriminating overlapping fingerprints on the handle of the door, which had already been debunked by a formal federal investigator in the hotel main. Dr. Heinrich now took back his original testimony and revealed that he himself had been mistaken about the authenticity of the fingerprints and now believed them to be fake. Wow, okay, this is just cooked. Your prosecution is cooked. No wonder this guy was like, I don't need to do a closing statement. This is insane. Let's just go play golf and let them just give us non-guilty and we'll get out of here. I'd still like, I'd recommend you go into it full bore defense, but I can see why they might want to slack off because this prosecution is a joke. And uh, oh, and party gazette Previn made another appearance, this time to testify that Matthew Brady and intimidated her and forced her to lie in her original police statement. There seemed to be so little going for the prosecution that the outcome may have seemed like a no-brainer. But the verdict was surprising. After another 40 hours of deliberations, another hung jury was declared, leading to another mistrial. Once again, the jury had found themselves deadlocked in a 10-2 vote, but this time, the 10-2 majority was quite bizarrely in favor of conviction of Roscoe Arbuckle. What is going on? It was later suggested that the lack of testimony from Arbuckle and the sheer laziness of the defense had suggested to the jury that the defense didn't expect a favorable outcome and couldn't be asked to put up a fight. Oh my God. They're not putting up a fight because they think they're going to win. The prosecution has nothing. The defense team, they knew they had to up their game for the third trial, which began on the 13th of March 1922, and this time they were pulling no punches. In fact, they got incredibly nasty. Remember when Arbuckle requested that his defense team should show respect to the dead and refrain from digging up jurors on Virginia Rapp's private life? Well, that idea went out the window of a top story hotel room. I mean, look, at some point, you've done two trials and been missed trials. It's like, okay, look, we thought this was going to be a shoe in, but we got to pull out the big guns and we just got to get this done, Fatty. And Fatty's like, okay, guys, let's go. Gavin McNabb found witnesses who claimed that Virginia often drank heavily at parties and had a habit of taking her clothes off in front of the other guests and, shock horror, was known to be sexually active. It also implied that her health conditions had been further complicated by as many as five backyard abortions dating from when she was a young teenager and that some of those illegal procedures may have been badly botched. It's hugely important to note that I couldn't find a single scrap of compelling evidence that any of this was remotely true and there is no medical proof that Virginia had ever had an abortion in her life. But Gavin McNabb was ruthless in his determination to paint the victim as an out of control Control, sexually promiscuous exhibitionist drunk who had brought all of this on herself. I'd like to think there were other factors which resulted in the jury taking a more favorable view of Arbuckle the third time around. Arbuckle gave a heartfelt testimony in which he again protested his innocence, and McNabb had clearly woken up as he delivered a robust defense and tore the prosecution witnesses to shreds. In his closing statements, McNabb appeared to passionately expose the sheer ludicrousness of a case which should have never come to court. He explained how Matthew Brady had been conned by the testimony of a known extortion described as the complaining witness that never witnessed, and had then proceeded to build a case by bullying other supposed witnesses into making false statements. This is so corrupt and so bad. If I was that other lawyer, I'd be worried I'm going to get disbarred. Or whoever's doing the um, the pushing of the, 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 the false statements. That feels criminal. The prosecution really had nothing to fall back on this time, and the jury knew it. As the, After the protracted deliberations of the first two trials, this third jury took a mere six minutes to declare their unanimous verdict. Roscoe Arbuckle is not guilty. This could have all been avoided, defense, if you did your job the second time around, okay? Don't get lazy. I say it took six minutes for the jury to make up their minds. They must have spent at least four or five of those minutes putting together a statement which effectively served as an apology on behalf of the United States for ever putting Arbuckle on trial in the first place. Seeing as the jury might have been pushed 
pushed for time, I'm sure Arbuckle would have been more than happy with something short and snappy and to the point. Something along the lines of soz fatty. But the statement read out in court by the jury foreman went way beyond that, and let's read it in full now. Acquittal is not enough for Roscoe Arbuckle. We feel that a great injustice has been done to him. We feel also that it was only our plain duty to give him this exoneration under the evidence, for there was not the slightest proof adduced to connect him in any way with the commission of a crime. He was manly throughout the case and told a straightforward story on the witness stand which we all believed. The happening at the hotel was an unfortunate affair for which Arbuckle, so the evidence shows, was in no way responsible. We wish him success. And hope the American people will take the judgment of 14 men and women who have sat listening for 31 days to evidence that Roscoe Arbuckle is entirely innocent and free from all blame. This witness statement was then passed directly onto Arbuckle, who is reported to have treasured it for the rest of his life. I bet he especially liked the bit where they called him manly and never have gotten that kind of praise from Helen Bloody Hubbard. He didn't get off entirely scot free. Let's not forget the scoundrel was hosting a party flowing with illegal booze during Prohibition. For that, he was fined $500 after being found guilty of violating the Volstead Act. He's like, oh, no, just throws some money at them while he walks out of court. But I wouldn't imagine that kept him awake at night. No, I imagine it wouldn't. He was fairly rich. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever know for sure what exactly happened in room 1219 on the 5th of September 1921. Perhaps Roscoe Arbuckle was telling the complete truth, but it's suspicious that he felt compelled to change his story so dramatically and rendered the original version, in which he insisted he had never been alone with the Virginia, a tissue of lies. If the story could change so much from the original police statements to the court testimony, could it have changed again under further pressure? Was Roscoe Arbuckle still hiding something? I'm quite intrigued that the opinion at the time seemed to be firmly divided into two distinct camps. Roscoe Arbuckle was either a sexual predator who was responsible for the death of Virginia Rapp, or he was a man who had just happened to wander into his own hotel room as a party guest fell ill. There seems to be little suggestion of anything in between. Could Arbuckle not have been telling the whole truth about the events which were not a criminal nature, but also not something that he wanted made public? The fact that Arbuckle was in his pajamas and Virginia was partially undressed during their time together in the hotel room was always going to raise a few eyebrows. Whilst Arbuckle was separated from his wife Midger at the time, he was still legally married and wasn't known for chasing other women. It's not entirely implausible that something entirely consensual was going on between Arbuckle and Virginia in the hotel room before Virginia suddenly became ill, but Arbuckle didn't want this to be known. And yet surely he would have eventually decided that telling the whole truth and just facing a little embarrassment about any intimate details was a better option than just making shit up and facing the risk of getting sent to prison for manslaughter. I think, in my opinion, what probably was the case was at first he was embarrassed about this and so he told a slightly different story and then he was more calculating about it and decided what he needed to say and what he didn't and he saw how weak the prosecution case was and he was like cool to get off on this i don't need to and his lawyer probably said you don't need to reveal this stuff and it's not material to the case so don't whilst we don't ever know all the details we do know that virginia app tragically died from a pre-existing health condition which had been causing her grief for quite some time and that roscoe arbuckle had been cleared of any charges relating to her death and was now free to pursue the next chapter of his movie career. However, the career of one of the most famous silent stars in the world was about to go through a particularly quiet phase. Fatty's Downhill Ride Arbuckle wasn't exactly rolling around in money by the time the trials were finally over. His juicy $3 million contract with Paramount had been terminated, and he had to sell his mansion and his cars to pay off the $700,000 he now owed in legal fees to his attorneys. That's close to $12 million in today's money. You think Gavin McNabb might have at least offered him compensatory discount for practically falling asleep during the second trial? Yes, he bloody well should have. Arbuckle was keen to get back to work and back on the payroll, but despite his acquittal, he was to find that his old films were still banned and that he had become the first Hollywood star to be blacklisted by the industry. Hollywood had been rocked by the scandal and was now a general vibe that Tinseltown's mask had slipped to reveal a dark underbelly of wild parties and debauchery and illegal booze and adultery. Protest groups were now suggesting that the still completely unregulated industry always built on a foundation of immorality and that the studios had free reign to produce their corrupted material without fear of restriction or any kind of censorship. Looking back, it's a bit strange to think that long before the days of age rating certificates for movies, a young child could technically be let inside a cinema to watch adult material. Yeah, it's not exactly the most shocking thing about the past, though, is it? There's all sorts of sh Still, you would hope the cinema staff would exercise their own common sense policy of seven year old Timmy Biscuit not being able to see Murder Rampage of lusty naked space vixens on cocaine. I don't know. I'd watch that. I, I mean, I'm old, but I'd have, a seven year old Simon would have loved to see Murder Rampage of lusty naked space vixens on, on cocaine. What's cocaine? What's a vixen? But now the Hollywood bosses were getting a bit nervous that the US government might start sniffing around and imposing their own strict regulations on the relatively new industry. Yep, regulate yourself or get regulated. That is how it goes. So in a preemptive strike, the major 
major movers and shakers in Hollywood got together to form a new organization called the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America and stuck the former postmaster, William H. Hayes, in charge of it. The idea was that Hayes would still be cleaning up the dark corners of a now self-regulating and self-censoring Hollywood without the need for national interference. The later introduction of the Code of Conduct Guidelines, known as the Hayes Code, was a hugely important milestone in the movie industry, sowing the seeds for the end of the pre-code era and heralding a new dawn in which film studios could no longer get away with producing any old muck. But one of Hayes' very first acts as the head of the new organization, which would change the landscape of cinema forever, was to ban the screenings of any old Roscoe Arbuckle films and also ban him from appearing in any new ones. Good lord, they just sue, 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 sue. The really was carried out very much at the best of the studio moguls who had installed Hayes in the organization to do their bidding. This is ho- His career's just destroyed and he did nothing. Although Arbuckle had been acquitted just 10 days before this announcement, Hayes later recalled in an autobiography that the studios felt the scandal had tainted the whole industry, and Arbuckle had to be thrown under the bus to deflect any further speculation about what the other wealthy movie stars might be getting up to in their spare time. There was no space for the toxic Arbuckle in this new squeaky clean Hollywood, whether he had been proved innocent or not. This is partly the reason why so many of Roscoe Arbuckle's hundreds of films no longer exist today. There wasn't much effort made to preserve films in the early days anyway, which is why so many other silent classes have been lost to the sands of time will never be seen again. But Arbuckle's surviving that catalogue is particularly sparse in comparison to his contemporaries, and this could be down to the fact that many of the films were banned or burned or tossed in the bin on the grounds that they were rendered utterly useless and worthless by the ban. He certainly hasn't been erased from history, as you can still watch restored Fatty Arbuckle films on DVD today, but around half of his extensive entire back catalogue has been destroyed. Whilst the ban may have seemed a harsh punishment for an innocent man, it only actually lasted eight months before William H. Hayes grew a backbone and generously moved to lift. It. However, for many years afterwards, theaters were still reluctant to show old Arbuckle movies, and the actor found it difficult to find work. During these wilderness years, his old mate Buster Keaton had already closed down the old comic production company, but had since formed his own new bigger production company called Buster Keaton Comedies, and now agreed to give 35% of all the company's profits to Arbuckle to help alleviate his financial stress. Buster Keaton, you legend. That is good friendship right there, and I love it. But Arbuckle still found himself on a downer and turned back to the bottle after his personal life took a tumble alongside his professional career. Yeah, I mean, it's nice that he gets 35% of the profits, and I'm sure that's plenty of money to keep him going and stuff. But he's also an actor. He wants to act and he wants to perform. It's not just about the money. Uh, It's just sad if you don't get to do that. Like, I like, I mean, I'm not an actor, but I like making these videos. And if I just got paid and didn't do that, it would be a genuine bummer. I don't like to sit around on my ass all day and just get paid for doing nothing. I mean, I do, but I also like working and doing this. A strange wife, Minter Defee, eventually filed for divorce in 1925, yet she stayed good friends with Roscoe and later noted, Roscoe was the most generous human being I've ever met. If I had to do it all over again, I'd still marry the same man. Arbuckle swiftly remarried the same year to actress Doris Dean, but his alcoholism led to an unhappy relationship and Doris filed for divorce just three years later on the grounds of desertion. Although Arbuckle eventually managed to get a few bit parts in shorts in the 1920s, it was a far cry from the heady days when he was the leading star in feature films. One of the entries into his IMDb profile during this period says it all, really. The former headliner of five real epics was reduced to this kind of entry for the lost 1927 short Listen, Lena. Fat man with strategically covered face. Uncredited. Between 1924 and 1932, he had a little more success behind the camera than in front of it, although the cinema audience wouldn't have been aware of this at the time. He worked as a director on a series of low-profile shorts under the pseudonym William Goodrich, a slight twist on his original idea of Will Be Good, which sounded more like an apologetic promise than a pseudonym. Actress Louise Brooks recalls feeling a sense of excitement when she realized she was going to be directed by the legendary Roscoe Arbuckle in the 1931 comic short, Windy Riley goes to Hollywood, but she was left somewhat disappointed by his lack of energy on set. She's revealed he made no attempt to direct this picture. He just sat in the director's chair like a dead man. However, things were finally beginning to look up for Arbuckle by 1932 in both his professional and personal life. After finally putting down the whiskey bottle, he married his third wife, actress Addie McPhail, and the happy couple would remain together for the rest of Arbuckle's life. The very same year, Fatty Arbuckle was destined to make a surprising bounce back to the silver screen. He signed a deal with Warner Brothers to star in six two-reelers shown in 1932 and 1933, all of which would be well received. The silent film star even got the chance to use his voice in these newfangled talky pictures for the first time. Four of these shorts had already been released by the time Arbuckle and Daddy McPhail were celebrating their first wedding anniversary on the 28th of June 1933. The couple had invited a small group of friends out to dinner as a joint celebration of the wedding anniversary and the beginning of Roscoe Arbuckle's remarkable comeback, which now looks set to go one step further with the talk of a new Warner Brothers feature film on the horizon. Arbuckle is reported to have told his friends, this is the best day of my life, as they all chinked glasses 
bodies and tucked into their crab meat cocktails. The very same night, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle died in his sleep from a heart attack at the age of 46. Wow, day to go out though. If you're saying this is the best day of my life and you die that night, you died happy, but only 46. It's often remarked upon that the comic career of Roscoe Arbuckle ended up playing out as a tragedy. One of the biggest and greatest talents to emerge from the very early days of Hollywood had his career destroyed by scandalous allegations of which he was fully acquitted, yet he still couldn't escape the blacklist and cancellation. And whilst his contemporaries would forever be etched into legend over the course of the next century, Roscoe Arbuckle's legacy was largely demolished and forgotten. It's certainly a story in which appalling behavior was displayed on both sides, and a very few people involved in the saga came out of it looking good. The circus trials were sparked by an extortionist looking to squeeze money out of a Hollywood legend by making wild accusations. These were pursued by attorney Matthew Brady, who appeared to be trying to further his own career by intimidating witnesses into lying to prop up his crumbling case. I really hope he got in trouble for that. We didn't get a follow-up on that, which means he probably didn't get in trouble, but it's so unethical. He should have his bar license removed or whatever they do. Roscoe Arbuckle gave conflicting accounts of what happened that night and then helped his defense team push a false narrative in which the hung jury of the first trial could be entirely blamed on one vindictive female juror. After falling asleep during the second trial, this defense team managed to secure an acquittal for the third, but only after resorting to a shameless character assassination of Virginia Rapp. And this, perhaps, is the biggest tragedy of all. Virginia Rapp is one of the few characters of this tale who did nothing wrong at all, aside from falling seriously ill at the wrong time and the wrong place. Even years after her death, the rumors still swirled that she was a troublesome alcoholic parasite who was down in the gutter and who once spread public lice around Keystone Studios. There's no evidence to suggest that she was anything other than a young, talented and successful woman who was just trying to forge a new career in the movie industry. But after her life was cut short by an incredibly painful health condition, her name was dragged through the mud by the gutter press who were keen to sell a story and the defense team who were keen to get their clients off the hook at any cost. In some people's eyes, Virginia is ruthlessly dismissed as the desperate hanger-on who was inconsiderate enough to fall ill during a party and a great inconvenience to a movie star. If only she'd stayed at home and died somewhere out of the way. No, she's innocent in this story. She didn't even accuse him of anything. It's ridiculous. Maud is that the woman who really kicked this all off. I don't like her. There are actually plenty of if-onlys from the perspective of Roscoe Arbuckle. If only the police judge Sylvie and Lazarus hadn't brought the case to trial for the most unfathomable of reasons, despite believing he was probably innocent. If only Arbuckle hadn't decided to throw an illegal party. If only he'd accepted the alternative offer of a nice yachting weekend with Buster Keaton. If only he'd decided to stay home and rest his scorched buttocks. And whilst the reputation of a seriously ill woman was so callously ripped apart following her tragic death, I think it's reasonable to to reserve some sympathy for Roscoe Arbuckle, whose own legacy was swiftly destroyed from the consequences of a party that should never have been thrown. Yes, there can absolutely be two people who suffer because of this. He's often still regarded by some as the disgraced actor who sexually assaulted a woman with a champagne bottle, which did not happen. That's just like William Randolph Hearst and his yellow journalism book. This blatant press fabrication is a far cry from the eulogy by someone who actually knew him, 20th Century Fox co-founder Joseph Schneck. To quote him, all who have ever known the real Roscoe Arbuckle will always treasure the great, generous heart of the man. His was the tragedy of a man born to make the world laugh and to receive only suffering as his reward, and to the end he held no malice." End quote. Cinema aficionados may still remember Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle as an early pioneering comic genius, but many more will remember him as an early victim of cancel culture and the man who accidentally prompted a far-reaching cleanup of Hollywood which spelt the end of the pre-code era. When it comes to his actual film career, and all those missing movies. The superstar of silent cinema uh, was the talk of the town for so many years before, sadly, slipping in to a century-long silence. B-movie double feature, The Curse of Fatty Arbuckle. Perhaps Roscoe might be better remembered today if a recent blockbuster movie chronicled his mighty rise and fall. It makes you wonder why nobody is bothered, as the story seems like prime popcorn fodder. It does. This would make a great movie. Well, it turns out that such a movie has been in development hell for several decades, but the problem is that the big name attached to the star role has always ended up dropping dead before the camera can start rolling. Blues Brothers star John Belushi was one of the first names attached to the screenplay, but then he died after being given a fatal speedball shot in 1982. Stand-up comedian and actor Sam Kinison was later offered the role, but he was tragically killed in 1992 in a car collision with a drunk driver. John Candy was said to have signed on to play Arbuckle before he suddenly died from a heart attack in his sleep in 1994, and comedian Chris Farley was reportedly offered the role on the condition that the troubled star stayed clean for two years in order to film and to secure insurance. He died from a drug overdose in 1997 at 33. The fact that all these actors died so suddenly and so closely to the time that they were connected to the famous role has naturally led to speculation that the project is haunted by the curse of Fatty Arbuckle's ghost whose specter looms large over any attempt to put him back on the cinema screen. 
It's an intriguing thought and also total nonsense. Perhaps a more likely explanation is that a certain breed and shape of actor would be required to comfortably fill Roscoe Arbuckle's shoes, and without wanting to sound too mean, that's unlikely to be an actor who has a gym membership and treats his body like a temple. In some of these cases, the cause of death is more likely to be related to a speedball injection and too many KFC buckets than any curse. Still, with the project apparently still in development, it would be a brave man to risk permanent cancellation of a very different kind by signing on the dotted line. And that's where we end today's episode of the podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Fascinating story. Like, an hour and a bit went by. An hour and a half, almost. And I was just completely absorbed. Thank you, Danny, for writing it. Thank you to Jen, who does the fantastic editing on this show. And I'll see you next time. 